Hello everybody and welcome to Pisa Presents with a look into the wide, wonderful, and rainbow world of gemstones. So first of all, you may be asking yourself, well, what is a gemstone really? Gemstone is defined as a physical substance that when cut and polished can be used in lapidary, that is jewelry, or as ornamentation. So the IGS, International Gem Society, that is, lists 315 gemstones, although that number greatly varies. Why is it? Because, well, thankfully, no two cultures are alike, and what one culture in history has considered a gem or a gemstone, another culture may not have even heard of. So depending on where you are throughout time and in various places of the globe, the term gem is, well, kind of in flux. Now, a lot of time when people think of gem, they think of something like, say, diamond, emerald, ruby, sapphire. And you know what? That's, that's fine in principle. Those are very, very famous gems. Typically, those are in the group that are what is termed precious gemstones. Compare that with other ones that are called semi-precious. Now, just so that you're aware, though, those terms are gradually falling out of disfavor because of the implied semi-precious, semi, it's almost like it's not as good as the other ones, and because of what we just went through earlier, different cultures considering different things a gem and not, basically, instead of just using precious or semi-precious, what do you say? Well. You just call everybody's gemstone a gemstone and forget calling something semi or just precious itself. They're all the same. So now to start off some of these gems, first off is agate, which Mindat defines as a distinctly banded fibrous calcedony, which is a very word salad way to describe an extremely stunning specimen like that. I mean, you just look at it and it's absolutely gorgeous. Agate has been used since classical times, so say the ancient Greeks and Romans, and I picked that not only because it's utterly gorgeous, it's a Mexican crazy lace agate to be exact, but it also employs the rather entertaining tendency of some people to use anything other than a ruler to gauge measurement, so that particular agate is about five tennis balls wide. Alexandrite, which is a form of chrysoberyl, was first found in Russia. It was named for the then Prince Alexander II, later Tsar, or basically their emperor. Now, Alexandrite shows a color change in natural versus incandescent light, which that is the same specimen right there, just natural versus incandescent. Amber is, of course, fossilized resin, and its usage in lapidary dates to 13,000 years ago. That right there are different colors of just Baltic amber, which is probably the most famous type of amber is that from Baltic regions. Beryl is a various, well, beryl is a gem of many types. Two of them are aquamarine and morganite. One we'll go into later. My personal favorite is aquamarine. Now, it was once more priced if green, but today's choice color is blue. We know that because of, uh, like say sales standards and what have you. Morganite was named for the financier JP Morgan too. So birthstones, okay. The origins of birthstones are very debated. It isn't quite as bad as what this Rupert Glito says where they were quote, nothing but a feast of unfounded states salesmanship. Now there are in many cultures all throughout the world uh, whether they be gemstones or even a particular plant or an animal, the tradition of associating something with the birth month is by far and away not a new idea. It's one that is very, very old. So you can look at it that way in that in concept, the idea of a birthstone is a very old one. It may have its origins in a couple of passages in the Bible that denote a breastplate referencing the 12 tribes of Israel. There's for each particular tribe, there's one stone, but that's something that both biblical scholars and gemologists argue about a little bit. It's maybe not true. Now, it isn't until the 16th century that records specifically denote the practice of observing gemstones. So it's kind of old, really. And however, the modern list was only standardized in 1912. So chrysolite is actually not a mineral. 
It's a name given to several green minerals such as chrysoberyl, olivine, my favorite in the group, or phrenite. Coral and shell has been in used has been in use as ornamentation since prehistory. So that right there is a necklace made by a Navajo craftsperson and is on display at the absolutely stunningly wonderful Brooklyn Museum. I highly recommend it if you haven't been. So yes, a uh, coral shell, well shell was considered a gem by the Navajo. Lots of other cultures considered shells gems as well. Now, diamond is not quartz or any other mineral, but bonded carbon. Do not go with me to a, like say, a little rock and gem shop or do internet searching and it just drives me crazy if I see a website or somebody says, yes, that Herkimer diamond really is a diamond. No, it isn't. A diamond itself is just a diamond. That right there is probably the world's most famous diamond, the Hope Diamond, which is on display at the Smithsonian, and for reasons that escape me, is always given an absolutely hideous setting. Now, how do you spot a fake diamond? Well, you can use temperature chests, things like water, say one will sink versus uh, one will float, or checking its behavior in light. So if you were to sign a light up to something like that, you, if you could get close enough to the Hope Diamond, which you can, it's actually in back of glass, but if you were to shine a light on that, you would get the play of it, the play of the light across the stone that you would get with really most other real diamonds. You can't get that with a fake diamond. It's just not constructed the same way. Now, emerald is another variety of beryl. Its name actually predates that for beryl. In other words, we came up with a word for emerald before we came up for the word that actually what it was. Now that green color is due to the presence of chromium. So here is garnet, speaking of green, that can be one of the many, many colors of garnet, which is actually not a single mineral, but a rather large group of minerals. Now, right there, you see various colors of grossular garnet going from that amberish one to the left all the way down to the green. And that's another uh, photo from the Smithsonian. Jasper is yet another not official mineral name. It usually denotes something that is like a reddish brown color, in part because Jasper has a tendency to have a lot of iron with it. It's associated with iron minerals, banded iron formations. But this right here, I picked just to show the variety because it's actually green jasper. It is, to be exact, a ring from Egypt in green jasper and gold from 664 to 322 BCE. Lapis lazuli is the name given to the mineral formerly known as lazurite or the rock that hosts it. It's not only been used as a gem, but also too is a pigment for a particular paints like back in a lot of places during the Western Renaissance in order to say paint a picture of the Virgin Mary you had to use lapis it was just basically nothing else was considered good enough. Now moonstone is yet again not an official mineral it's the term given to a white feldspar with blue tones that have an effect called odularescence where it basically has that shimmery thing right there. Some people com uh, compare it to the shimmery effect of clouds or of the moon itself. So opal is not a mineral, uh, not a mineral, but a mineral lloyd is what it's called. Pearls are indeed formed inside the shell of a mollusk. You get a tiny little piece of dirt and then forming around it is what's called nacre, N-A-C-R-E. And then it just forms and forms and forms basically all these little concentric rings around it until you form a pearl. So peridot, which is one of my favorite minerals, it's a variety of forsterite, has a rather interesting history. Uh, we've been able to tell from looking at source documents that a lot of times people have mistaken it for emeralds and vice versa. Very famous locality for Peridot is there's actually, it's sometimes called the Gem Beach. There is a beach in Hawaii that has green sand because it's mostly just Peridot and related minerals. I tried to go there when I was in Hawaii, but the road into it was blocked for a very Hawaii reason, which was a volcano had just erupted and actually covered up the only road in and out of this beach. Nobody was hurt, fortunately.
So this right here is quartz. Some well, it's what uh, public access images call quartz. So some noted varieties of quartz are amethyst and citrine, which allegedly is that. Now, any variety has the same formula, SiO2. So amethyst has that formula, citrine has that, just absolutely clear quartz or milky quartz. Now, the colors themselves are from impurities within the crystal lattice. A lot of times, and even at the last meeting, people ask about fake citrine, which is getting to be an increasingly problematic thing. Now, so again, this was literally a public access image that I pulled up. It was one of the first ones that I pulled up on the source that I use. And I'm looking at this and it's just, this would be a very good teaching moment because that is one heck of a sus citrine. So basically how you can tell, first of all, uh, you can get that sort of color if you superheat amethyst. So that's what some disreputable people do because citrine is one of the rarer colors of quartz, that orange tone to it. So basically some will superheat amethyst with to about 878 to 1382 Fahrenheit, or if you're Celsius, it's 470 to 750. Now, how can you tell them apart? Well, look at that uniform color where it's orange. It's all the same value and tone of orange from top to bottom. You don't have any inclusions, anything that's within it, any darker areas like it should if it's a natural crystal. So if you have that tang color orange all throughout the whole thing, then chances are it's probably superheated citrine. This right here is sapphire, which is a variety of corundum, specifically a star sapphire. Iron or titanium makes it blue. Here is a spinel, which is commonly used as an aesthetic substitute for ruby. It can actually though have many, many more colors. I find it more interesting than ruby myself, but I don't know. I just like magnesium minerals. Now here is tanzanite, which is a gem variety of zoisite, that huge formula right there. It has a blue and purple color. Now this was only discovered in 1967, which is interesting because it's a very, very popular and very well documented stone. Why is that? Because of one heck of a good PR campaign. So it was discovered and they wanted to make it kind of like the next best thing, gemologically speaking, since sliced bread. So they just advertised the heck out of it. And it made a lot of people kind of think that it had been more established than what it was. And it was able to gain a foothold in jewelry circles. So yeah, as pretty as it is, Tanzanite actually hasn't been around for that long. Now, topaz has been around for a long time, and for some decades, because of that, it actually sort of fell out of favor. It got to be regarded as the sort of thing that, say, um, no offense by this, but basically it was what an associate of mine once called a grandmother stone. It was the type of thing that your grandma would wear, but somebody that was a bit younger necessarily wouldn't. But nowadays, with the resurgence in things like, say, cottage core and a lot of those other aesthetic styles, it's becoming more popular again. Oops, wrong way. Sorry, folks. And then turquoise has a large historical significance on many, many continents, many Mesoamerican ornaments or named out, made out of turquoise. And then lastly, we have zircon, which is best known for being a more affordable alternative to diamond. So I thank you very much, folks, for joining us on this look into the world of gemstones. So just have a peek yourself sometimes outside and go see what maybe you might consider a gem yourself. So thank you much and have a good day now. Bye.